Hello! Whilst recently on my holidays, I met a strange man and he told me I had two minutes to create a maze that would take him longer than one minute to solve. So I did this. And said solve that! There you go, and if you haven't guessed already, this video is about mazes. But more specifically, it's about algorithms, and this is an algorithm that I have loved since I was a child. I first encountered it in the BBC Micro magazines, where you had to type in the programs yourself from acres and acres of source listing. Rarely did the programs actually work, but this one always stuck with me, because it's a fantastic algorithm, and it's perfect, and it's complete, and we'll look at the details of it later. And I think it's a great example of programming and computer science at its absolute best. And just in case you're wondering, today I am living proof that programmers and coders actually go outside. So there we go. Now before we get stuck into the code, I'm just going to provide a quick primer for the uninitiated, and that is what is a stack, because this is fundamentally a stack-based algorithm. And a stack can also be known as a LIFO, which stands for last in, first out. Some people may also call it a philo. It's the same thing. And the idea is I want you to imagine a box like this, and if we put some data into this box, it sits at the bottom. And then if we put in some more data into the box, it sits on top. But we can't access this data at the bottom anymore. We can only take off the last bit of data that was put on. And there's a little bit of terminology. We always push items onto the stack and we pop items from the stack and the top of the stack is always the most recent item that was pushed onto it. Now because this is a video primarily about algorithms I'm not going to go into the implementation of the stack. There are many ways to do it. Suffice it to say that if your system or your code uses a stack it will behave like this. Now the algorithm I'm going to talk about for developing a maze is known as the recursive backtracker. I'm unsure of the origins of this algorithm, but it's been around for a very long time and has some fantastic properties. But whenever you want to write code that involves a more complex algorithm than normal, it's always good to get the pen and paper out first. Make sure you understand it. So I'm going to go through it by hand here on this very simple maze, and it's 4x4. Four four. And along the top here, along my x-axis, I've got four cells, 0, 1 to 3, and I've got my y-axis going down. My plan is to fill this 4x4 array with a maze. And I'm going to start by arming my stack with some data. And I'm going to arm it with the starting coordinate, which in this case is going to be 0, 0. So that's 0 along and 0 down. I'm going to mark that cell as being visited. So any cells that have a blue blob in the middle are going to be visited, and I'm going to get a tick here. And I'll know when to stop my algorithm, because I should have visited all of the cells at the end, and I'll, therefore I'll have 16 ticks. Now I'm not going to make you sit through all of this, I will speed up parts of it, but it's a nice visual example of how the algorithm is put together. Don't forget that even though there's only one item in my stack, the top of my stack is 0, 0. And the algorithm goes like this. From my current position, which is the top of the stack, I've got to choose one of my neighbours randomly. So from position 0, 0 here, I've got a choice of this neighbour, 1, 0, or this neighbour, 0, 1. I roll a dice, create a random number, and I select uh, 0, 1. So I set that cell to be visited, and I create a link. Update my visited count, and I've pushed the new location onto the top of my stack. So now I repeat. I look at my immediate neighbours and choose one of them at randomly that I've not already visited. So my immediate neighbours consist of 0, 0, 1, 1, and 0, 2. Well, 0, 0 doesn't count, because I've already visited it. After rolling my dice, I've decided that I'm going to move east, and I create a link to it. Push the new cell onto the top of my stack, and mark the cell as visited. So one more time with commentary for completeness, I take the top of my stack, I choose a random direct neighbour. So in this case I've got 1, 0, 2, 1, 0, 1, and 1, 2. I can't use this neighbour because I've already visited. Randomly choosing, I'm going to go again to the east. Push the new coordinates to the top of my stack and update my visited count. So now I've let the algorithm run for a few iterations and we've hit a problem. I now need to choose a neighbour that's not been visited before. So my immediate neighbours are of course now 0, 0, 1, 1, 
and 2 0. However, they've all been visited, so I have no neighbours which haven't been visited. I've now got to backtrack, and this is where the stack became useful. The stack contains a history of all the locations that I visited. So the top of my stack is my current location, and if I pop the top of the stack, I can move back one. But note, I don't remove anything from the visited column. And here I face the same situation, all of my neighbours I visited before, so I've got to move back one by popping off the top of the stack. Now I'm back at this location, this is the first cell as we're backtracking that's got a neighbour that I can actually plot into. Which in this case is 3-2. All of the other neighbours are not available, they've already been visited. So I've got little choice, I've got to go here. So this is a new cell, so it becomes visited. And we pop the location onto the stack. And now we'll let the algorithm continue again. But now I've hit a dead end again, as we can see I've got no neighbours which I've not previously visited, so I've got to backtrack. And I do that by popping the top off the stack, and using the top of the stack to set my current position. And when I get to this location, I do have one neighbour I've not already visited. And it's the only one I can choose. And so here, I've now got 16 ticks, which is the number of cells that I've visited. This algorithm is really nice, because it guarantees completeness. It doesn't matter how big my maze is, it will fill all of the cells, and it guarantees that every cell can touch every other cell. So it doesn't matter where you start in the maze, you're guaranteed to get to the objective location within the maze. And like all perfect algorithms, it's completely scalable, not just in terms of dimensions of the maze, but in how you apply it. In this case, I've got a single cell where I can visit my immediate neighbours, north, south, east and west. But it needn't be the case. I could have many neighbours and apply the same algorithm and get a perfectly complete maze out of it. Once you've visited all the cells, it's up to your rendering algorithm to then try and draw the maze. So in this case, I'm going to fill in wherever I haven't got a link between two cells. So I'm going to draw a line here and here and here. And once I've filled in all the lines, I've effectively just developed the walls for my maze. At which point, we no longer need the stack, and we can get rid of all of this construction data. Which leaves us with a really nice, albeit rather small, maze-like structure. Now let's see how we would do this in code. I'm going to start with a blank int main program, as I always do. And I'm going to pull in the one lone coder console game engine, which you can see in the video marked in the little tab above. Now since this is the first video I've done that uses this technology, I'm only going to go over it very briefly because you can look at that other video for the finer details. But ultimately, I need to derive a class from my console game engine, which just handles all of the console stuff for me. If you've seen my other videos, you'll know that all of my programs involve creating a screen buffer and using get async key state to emulate some sort of game engine. I've wrapped that up into a nice tidy package that I've called the one lone coder console game engine. And there are two functions in this, onUserCreate, which is where we do all of our definitions and creating of resources, and onUserUpdate, which is basically a per frame function. So this is where we put all the fun stuff. And implementing the class couldn't be simpler. We just create the variable, we construct the console to the dimensions that we want, so in this case it's 160 characters across by 100 wide, and each console character is going to be 8 by 8 pixels. And then we call the start function. This is only for Windows. The construct console function calls things to the Windows operating system that define how the console should look. But you shouldn't let that put you off if you're a Linux or a Mac user. The algorithm is still going to be platform independent. Now for my maze algorithm, I know that it's fundamentally stack-based, so I'm going to include the stack from the standard library. And in the game class, I'm going to create some variables that define the maze. Specifically, my maze has a width, a height, and I'm going to create an array here dynamically, which stores a value for all the cells, and I'm going to use this value to tell me which neighbours the cell is connected to. And so to make this a little bit more readable, I'm going to create an enumeration here where I'm defining some constants. So for any given cell, I can tell whether it's connected to its neighbours, because the int value that represents that cell will contain the bits set in the appropriate locations. And if I visited the cell as well, 
I know that the algorithm also requires me to keep track of how many cells I've already visited. And finally, of course I'm going to need the stack, and this might use something a bit new to the One Lone Coder videos. I'm using the pair type. A pair allows you to store two things at the same time. I could create a struct here myself that stores an X and a Y coordinate, but I'm going to use the pair anyway. Why not? It's, it's new. And so I have a stack that stores an object which of type pair, but the pair is uh, templated to store two integers. The first one will be the X coordinate and the second one will be the Y coordinate. Now I'm ready to specify some parameters that define my maze. So I'm going to set the width of the maze to 40 and the height to 25. I've already predetermined that this dimension looks quite nice on the screen. And because I might want to play with these numbers later, I'm going to allocate the maze memory dynamically, based on the dimensions we've just set. But it's also quite important that we set all of the elements in the maze array to zero to begin with. And I'm using the memset command for this. I now need to specify the starting conditions for my maze. The stack has to have something in it to begin with, so I'm going to push onto that a new pair, and I'm going to use the make pair function, and we're going to start like I did uh, when I was drawing it by hand in the top left hand corner. Which means I also have to set that cell to be visited, and conveniently the top left corner uh, of my maze array also happens to have the index 0. I'm going to use one of the bits that I set before. And because I've already visited one cell, I'm going to set my visited cell count to 1. As you can see, there is very little required to initialise this algorithm. But it's important that you do. Before we get stuck in with the algorithm, I think it's quite important that we have a way to visualise it. That way we know if we're coding it in the right direction. So to begin with, on the onUserUpdate function, I'm going to clear the screen, and that involves basically drawing a space to my console um, in all locations, so that's screen width and screen height, uh, from the top left corner. And as discussed previously, my maze consists of a 2D array of cells. So I'm going to iterate through each of the cells, maze width and maze height. And for each cell in the array, I'm going to check does the integer have the cell visited bit set, in which case if it does we draw a white pixel, or a white block character to that location on the console, or we draw a blue one. So let's just have a quick look what that looks like. Well, it's a blue rectangle with a tiny little white dot, so that's good. I mean, that indicates that our maze uh, of the dimensions 40 by 25 does have 40 blue characters by 25 blue characters, and the one cell we've already set to visit it in the top left has been set. However, everything looks a bit small, and there's a problem. We don't have anywhere to draw the walls. I'm going to introduce the notion of a path width, which will specify how many on-screen console character cells represent a single cell in my maze. So for example, if the width is set to 2, I actually occupy a 2x2 two two block of cells on the console, which represents one cell in my maze. And then I can surround the two sides to the east and the south of that one cell with blocks that represent wall. So here's my 2x2 two two cell, and here is a 2x2 two two cell, and here is a 2x2 two two cell, and we've now got position to add walls. I only need to concern myself with walls at the east and south side of the cells, because if two cells are linked, then this cell loses its western wall, and this cell loses its eastern wall i.e. the wall is shared between them. And of course the same applies for north and south. So this is now cell position 0, 0, and this would become cell 1, 0, and this one would be 0, 1, and 1, 1. But the relationship to the console characters underneath is now the cell coordinate times 2 to get us to here, and we always plus 1 to give us some wall at the end. And of course that happens in both axes. So we can consider then a whole complete cell with walls and exits and everything else is a multiple of path width plus 1. Let's add another variable to our class, path width and we'll define this as being 3. So our 
Maze Cell will represent three console characters across and one for the wall. We then need to modify our drawing algorithm to accept this change in scale. So every position becomes multiplied by path width plus one. Let's take a look. Well, we can now see that it's spread out across the whole console, which is good, but it's not filled in the individual cells, which is bad. Therefore, I need an additional loop inside my maze loop here that draws in each cell. So for each cell in my maze, I'm now going to go through uh, each cell in the console for the path width. And we just have to add this on to the end. Let's take a look. Excellent. We now have cells which are 3x3 three three with a wall uh, of 1 on our console. Great. We're also going to need to draw in our pathways to overwrite the wall so we can show that the cells are connected. So if any of our cells have the path to east or path to south set, we also want to draw those in as well. And because our walls are always only one character thick, I don't need to do a two-dimensional plot this time and get away with a single-dimensional one. So I'm just going to go through the path width one at a time. And the first thing I want to do is check, well, does the cell, in this case, does it have a south path? And if it does, I want to draw in the cells to give us that passageway from uh, the north cell to the south cell. Or from the south cell to the north cell. Who knows? And we'll do the same for east to west. So if the cell has a passage from the east to the west in either direction, we want to overwrite the wall, the black cells in the background on the console. We want to draw them in with path colour, which is white. Now we've got a way to visualise the maze, let's get stuck into the really fun stuff. Let's actually create it. The maze creation can also go in the on user update function. And we want to create maze only if the number of visited cells is less than the width times the height, i.e. we can only do more maze development if there are any cells that we haven't visited. Step one is to create a set of the unvisited neighbours. Let's consider the north neighbour first. As we're working with 2D arrays, we don't want to go out of bounds and cause all sorts of memory errors. So, it's important that we don't check for neighbours that are out of bounds of our maze. And if we're checking for northern neighbours, that means we shouldn't be checking for any if we're currently on the top row of our maze, because they just don't exist. There aren't any northern neighbours. So that's the first thing I'm going to check for. And to do that, I'm going to take our stack, and I'm going to look at the element that's at the top of the stack, using the top function. And I'm going to check, because the stack contains pairs, I'm going to check the second element of that pair, which if you remember is our Y coordinate, and I'm going to ensure that it's greater than zero. Now we're trying to develop a list of all the neighbours that haven't been visited, so we need to check that in our maze array. And to do this we need to get the index. Now we're currently using the stack, and it's uh, using a pair of second and first for Y and X, and so that looks something like this, which you can see is a bit of a mouthful. And we want to see, has the cell visited flag bit been set? Which we'll do by checking if it's equal to 1. But this isn't very useful to us at all. In fact, it's very difficult to read. And the Y coordinate in this case would get replaced with minus 1, because we're checking for the neighbour above us uh, in our Y axis. And uh, the X coordinate gets set to 0, because we're checking in just in vertically. We're not bothered about the east to west. So in the event of us being in a valid location in the array, and that our neighbour to the north of us exists and hasn't been visited, we want to store this. And I'm going to do this by creating a vector. With the vector, I'm going to push to it an identifier, and in this case, I'm going to use zero that will say that my northern neighbour uh, exists and is unvisited. And I can use similar code to check for my eastern neighbour, which in this case I'm going to use 1 as the identifier, but here I don't want to check for minus 1, I want to check for 0 in the y-axis and plus 1 in the... Oh, you know what? This is actually getting too much. I've just gotten to the point where I can barely understand my own code, so I'm going to create a little lambda function to help me out. The lambda function is going to take an x and a y-coordinate, and do this horrible little bit of offsetting for me. So 
I'm going to change that to an X. And change that to a Y. And semicolon. I can get rid of this now and just call my lambda function. So if I'm checking uh, in the northern direction, I know I'm not bothered about X, but I'm looking at minus 1 in the Y. That's much, much tidier. And I can also do the same for my eastern function, which in this case I'm looking along the x-axis by 1, but I'm not looking in the y-axis at all. Now you might be thinking, why don't I just do this with a macro? Well, of course you could do this with a macro, but the language now provides the auto feature, and I quite like this. I like the lambda function approach to doing this. It means I'm forced to put the code where it's needed. Macros can be anywhere, and they're a little bit unregulated. They can get a bit dangerous and fiddly. We'll also exploit the fact that the if statement is checked in order, so we can get rid of this secondary call to if, which makes that line of code much more concise now. I'm going to repeat that for the other directions, and here we can see I've got now an ID of 0 for north, 1 for east, 2 for south, and 3 for west. You'll notice with the east and west neighbours, I'm not using the y component of the vector to check whether I'm in bounds or not, I'm using the x, which is the first of the pair. I've just flagged a little error here. I'm not actually checking if the cell is visited. Of course, I am checking if the cell is not visited. So I want to make sure that that is a 0 and not a 1. My apologies. So now I have a vector that contains only valid neighbours that I can visit, which I might not have any at all. So I need to check for that. If I don't have any, uh, then I'm going to be popping off the stack, if you remember the algorithm before. But let's for now assume that I do have some neighbours. And the nice thing about bundling things into a vector this way is it makes other operations easier. So I want to choose a neighbour at random. Well, to do this, all I need to do is randomly choose a number from the neighbour's size and use that as the index. So I can get something that tells me what direction is my neighbour now. And because I've been pushing 0, 1, 2 and 3, I know from this identifier which way to go next. So that's the value that gets stored into the next cell direction variable. The algorithm says that once I've chosen a neighbour, I then need to create a path between the neighbour and the cell that I'm currently in. Well, now that I know both of those cells, I'm just going to use a little switch block here and uh, fill in the blanks. So let's assume the neighbour is north. I want to create a path to the north. So my current cell, which is locally represented by 0, 0 here, because remember this lambda function uses the stack to work out where this is. It always uses the top of the stack and all of the coordinates are relative to the location at the top of the stack. So if there's a path to the north, I'm going to OR it with the path to the north bit. Whilst I'm here, I may as well tell the cell that's above me, i.e. my northern neighbour, that the one below it has a path to the south. I'm then going to push to the top of my stack the northern neighbour's coordinates. So as I push to the stack, I create a new pair the x-coordinate is the current top of the stack's x-coordinate plus 0, and the y-coordinate is the current top of the stack's second part minus 1. So this is the y-coordinate minus 1, so the northern neighbour. If any of this switch block executes, it assumes that I have now entered that new cell. So I need to increase my visited cell count. And I also need to make the cell that I am currently in, so the one that's now the top of the stack, which is the new cell, which I can index with 0, 0 now, I need to tell that cell that I have been visited. So I'll just put in new cell here as a bit of a reminder. Let's duplicate this code for the other options. So for south, instead of checking for minus 1, we're now checking for plus 1. And of course the southern neighbour, we set the northern path, and we set our current path to south. Let's not also forget the coordinates of the new cell. So all of this was on the condition that we had some neighbours that we hadn't visited. What if we didn't have any neighbours? Well, if you remember from the algorithm before, we need to backtrack. And because we're using a stack, that's really, really complicated. Done. So let's take a look and see what happens. Well, I think that's fantastic. We've got a really large and complex maze and labyrinth. I think it's really nice. 
I'm going to slow down the algorithm by adding a, an artificial delay. Remember, this is just for visualization. It's, it's not that important that we're, we're breaking some rules here. So I'm going to use the sleep for function to delay for 10 milliseconds in each of our on user update calls. This means we'll have a maximum of 100 cell updates per second, i.e. we're limiting the program to run at about 100 frames per second. Let's have a look. The algorithm is really pleasant to watch. We can see that it tries to draw the longest path that it possibly can, until it boxes itself in, and then it backtracks. To illustrate this, I've also got it to draw the top of the stack with a green rectangle. In many respects, this is similar to a flood fill algorithm, and we'll probably definitely have a look at those in the future. And so there you have it, a quick look at a very simple maze generation algorithm. There are many other algorithms for generating mazes, particularly if you want mazes with a set of properties, uh, such as long corridors or extra rooms. But you can always use this one as a starting point. For example, you could precede uh, some of the cells as being already visited. Now I appreciate that this video hasn't been as simple as some of my others, and this is going to happen from time to time. Sometimes the topics are quite complicated and need me to use more advanced coding techniques than perhaps you've seen in some of my other videos. And I'm still unsure yet about using something like the One Lone Coder uh, games console engine in the background. Uh, I don't know if it does actually accelerate the development of the code or the video, but I've got some other ideas for it for other projects which require things to be a bit more graphical, and I'm trying to avoid needing to develop a Windows application. Anyway, as usual, the code's going to be available on GitHub. You can download it, hack it, generate some mazes for me. If you've enjoyed this, give us a thumbs up. It does great wonders for my self-esteem. And uh, please think about subscribing. Lots of people have been subscribing recently, and I'm really grateful for some of the fantastic comments that people have been leaving. So please keep all that up, and I'll see you next time. Take care.